Welcome to the Renaissance Woodworker. I'm Shannon Rogers. What you're about to see is some footage that I took at Woodworking in America in 2016. I was hired to teach a couple of classes there and this is one of them. And frankly, I've been sitting on this footage for, well, two years because I didn't really think it, it was up to the quality of the footage that I normally get. And it's mainly because the camera angle is all wrong. I set up my camera off to the side, not knowing what I was thinking, so filmed the entire class basically in profile. But through the miracles of editing, I was able to patch in some of the slides that I showed, and I think the content is really valid. I think there's a lot of us working with wood that just don't understand its working properties and don't understand why one species works the way it does and why another doesn't. So long and short of it is, I feel like the message and the content in this lesson is incredibly valuable. And Despite it being a poor camera angle, I think that by bringing this to you guys, the general public, I think we can further a better understanding of wood, the material that we love to work. So I present from Woodworking in America 2016, wood, what is it good for? This lesson was born out of working at a lumber yard and assuming that things that were basic, in my mind, you know, well that makes sense, I use this wood for that and I use this wood for that and everybody knows that, right? Not so much. It, it was surprising to me how many people who had been woodworking for decades, commercially, amateurishly, hobbyistly, I don't know if that's a word, but just really had no clue. And the more I began to kind of talk to people about, well, have you tried this species or this species, there was a lot of, no, I haven't. Well, what do you use? Well, I use cherry and some cherry. you know, And I use pine for like secondary stuff. And, and people tend to get stuck in, in a little bit of a rut. And, at the root of that, I think, is lumber is expensive. You know, so it's like, well, I really wanted to try, you know, English brown oak, if you can find it, but it's expensive. You know, you're going to find it at $9 a board foot at places that actually have it, and usually, unless you're at Hearn Hardwoods in Pennsylvania, then it's $12 a board foot. You know, so it's, it's one of those things where it's really difficult to try a bunch of woods, and there's the fear of, well, I don't want to screw it up. Or you go and you find that piece and you, know, you get a deal on it or you, um, you know, sell a kidney and you get that board and now you're like, well, I'm gonna save it for the perfect project. And you really don't know how it works. So then say you, you pick it up and you do work with it. And as, as a you know, hand tool nut, this is even more uh, of a huge deal because you know, carbide can plow through anything, crank up the, the RPMs enough and you can do pretty much Anything, you know, you can work with ePay, which is as hard as granite, so you might as well. But on the hand tool side of things, you don't want to play an ePay. You know, even hard maple is a bear. So what I began to do, and this goes back to about six years ago when I started working for a lumber yard and I had to start compiling technical specs and putting them on our website because, you know, obviously the people who are in the industry, they must need this stuff, right? You know, somebody must know what all this is. And then I began um, kind of examining I work in marketing, so I'm examining the data and the analytics on my website and the little heat maps that show what people click on and what people hover on. Yes, we're watching you all the time. The heat maps are off the charts for these technical specs. Every single page on our website, every species page, has this column over on the right that gives you the technical specs, the Janka hardness, the bending strength, the shearing strength, all that stuff, maximum crushing strength. Who the hell knows what that is? But people were all over it. And I started to wonder, well, what, what's going on here? So then I called a couple of my customers and they then forwarded me over to the design department to some engineer who starts spouting E of V and E of S and E of something design values and equations and things about stress and structural tests and everything. And I started thinking, okay, the contractors, the people actually working the wood don't really pay attention to this, but somebody, at least in a commercial perspective, who's designing a boardwalk or a building or something like that, has had to make sure that it's not going to fall apart. You know, uh, when, um, what was the big hurricane? Sandy. When Sandy ripped up the, the East Coast and all the boardwalks had to be redecked, they had to go in and structurally re-engineer everything. And we're selling Ipe left and right to put down on these boardwalks. And you know, we're looking at deflection tests and all the data that surrounds that species on whether or not you could put down, it's not just a deck, but it's a deck that hundreds of millions of people walk across every single year and trucks drive up and down. Can it take all this stuff? So those technical specs, I started to realize there's a lot we can learn by paying attention to those. So then you start looking at those technical specs and you go, what in the world am I looking at? 
you know, 1.768 kilonewtons per meter. You know, my max crushing strength is 3.14 PSI. I don't know what that means. You know, wh why do I care that the bending strength, first of all, is it in kilonewtons or is it in pounds per square inch, depending on who did it, you know, if, is it, is, it's the whole metric imperial thing. But if we have an understanding, we all have that species, right? You know, I work with cherry a lot, or I do a lot of work with pine. And we know kind of intuitively how that works. Well, you can look that up and take those numbers and then compare it against this unknown species that maybe I'd like to work with this. And you can say, OK, I've got good experience hand planing cherry, and I just picked up some walnut. Man, that planes so beautifully. Well, you look at the data, and you look at the shearing force numbers. And that's really the number that tells you like, how easy it is it to shear that fiber apart between those layers. That's what you're doing with a hand plane. And the number on walnut is dramatically lower. Who cares what it is? It's just lower than it is in cherry. And you can look at cherry's density and cherry's porosity. I'm going to get to all this stuff and compare it to walnut. And you'll start to be able to draw conclusions to the point where you don't even have to put an edge to walnut. And you begin to know how walnut is going to work with a little asterisk, <laughs> because there's no substitute for putting edge to wood. So now I began thinking, well, how can we use this to diagnose stuff all over the world? I run a virtual woodworking school. I've got students on six continents. If anybody knows anybody in Antarctica, I will comp them, just so I can say I have seven continents worth of students. <laughs> but I'm constantly getting these emails like, well, I'm in Australia, and I, man, I, more so much admiration for Australian woodworkers because their wood is evil. It's just <laughs> silica rich and hard and tangled and twisted and it's just out of control. And they also tend to put names that we use on them. They put oak on a lot of stuff. That is not even close to oak that we've seen. Um, cedar, uh, what is it, uh, Australian yellow cedar, I think, tuna ciliatus. Oh my god, that's not any cedar I've ever seen. It's more like rock, you know? <laughs> so. I, there's no way I'm going to ever get an experience with this. So I get questions about, well, this is a problem I'm running into. I've got some red gum that I'm trying to play with, or some sort of Australian U. And I pull up the technical specs, and I start to compare it against the species that I know. And then I start drawing conclusions and saying, well, maybe you should try this. Or it's probably going to need this before you glue it. Or you might want to try something in order to make the planing go a little bit easier, all from those technical specs. And sure enough, people started getting back to me going, hey, that worked. That was great. So that's where this comes from. This is not really, we're not identifying wood species here. We won't be pulling out our hand lenses and doing the Bruce Hoadley thing and looking down the ingrain. There are lots of resources for that. And you might only get there 70% of the time. You know, uh, really identifying the actual species can sometimes be really, really difficult. You can send it out to labs, and even they come back with a plus or minus 10% accuracy, because sometimes you know, the world of wood just isn't, isn't, doesn't fit neatly into little taxonomic brackets here. But what we are going to do is take known species. I know that this is Kaya ivorensis, African mahogany. And I can figure out how it's going to work compared to what I already know. So I broke it into a three-part system. This chart over on the right is what I'm talking about. This is straight from um, the McIlvain, McIlvain, J. Gibson McIlvain Lumber is where I work. That's from the McIlvain website, or J. Ginty McStevenson, or whatever Mark Spagnuolo wants to call it but today. <laughs> this, there are a lot of different specs. Bending strength, maximum crushing strength, jank of hardness, uh, modulus of elasticity, modulus of rupture, all kinds of stuff. And, a lot of times, you can't find this data for every single species. You can generally, you can always find the Janka hardness. You can generally find the bending strength or the stiffness. Um, but you can't always find crushing strength. You can't always find shearing strength. Specific gravity is, at best, a dubious number. Density sometimes might be not showing up. So I started to realize we needed to find a couple of things that we can always count on. Hardness, or the Janka test. Um, the Jenka test is basically taking approximately a half inch steel ball and pressing it into the wood to half its depth. How many pounds per square inch does that take or how many kilonewtons does that take depending on what, which measurement system you're, you're living in. Um, specific gravity or really we can just talk about density. Specific gravity can be a little dubious just because depending on how wet or dry that lumber is, your specific gravity is going to change. So will your density. 
but uh, you know we're going to assume kiln dried ish lumber that's ready to work because even air dried lumber although it may work a little bit better than kiln dried it still has if it's the same moisture content it's going to be the same density you know you're not really well kind of <laughs> we're getting negligible if, if there are scientists in the room going that's not right because we went out to three decimal points and it's actually different you know we don't, we, don't, we don't need to get that accurate. Anything past the decimal point, let's just look at whole numbers at this point. Um, modulus of elasticity, also known as stiffness, is uh, if you're building workbenches, you know, how much of a span, how much deflection will I get? You know, the Rubo workbench relies upon that super, super thick top because there's no apron underneath it. You rely on good stiffness. Anybody who's read Chris Schwartz's Woodwork, wood Workbench's book, the blue one, there's a stiffness chart in there. And you can look at it and go, oh, these different species work really, really well. The fact of the matter is, when you get a six inch top, it doesn't matter what the species is, it's stiff. <laughs> See Roy Underhill sawing on top of his workbench yesterday. That was. Um, modulus of rupture, also known as bending strength. Um, this is how far can you bend it before it breaks. Um, whereas stiffness is how far can you deflect it and have it spring, spring back a little. Uh, and then shearing strength, and I, I put asterisks next to this because you may not always find shearing strength, but for the hand plane aficionados in here, this can actually be really telling. You know, there are density and hardness numbers of something like hard maple that line up with something like white oak, and yet white oak is so much easier to hand plane than hard maple. You tear out hard maple left and right, and white oak will actually plane quite nicely, assuming you have a sharp blade. And that number sometimes relates to shearing strength. You have a question? Um, wood's not even across all dimensions. Mm -hmm. Where are they measuring the shearing strength? They're measuring it parallel to the fibers. Oh. Yeah. And that's the other thing. Each one of these has a set test condition. In order to get some standardization in these numbers, they have to say, um, like with the instance of specific gravity, they get the moisture content down to 8%, and they measure the specific gravity and the density at 8%. Um, some places will actually measure it at 25%, so you get a green number and a dry number. So a lot of times, if you look at, uh, you can actually see, well, you may not be able to see from here, but this, uh, this column is green, this column is dry. So we've got numbers at both 25% and 9% uh, really is what they, what they measure it at. But everything else is saying, well, like the hardness test, they're not driving that metal ball into the end grain. They're driving it into the face grain itself. Uh, otherwise, you would have varying numbers there. I might need a board for. So, uh, if you have got all your numbers from one individual source, your chances are pretty good that they are all essentially talking about the same tests and all the same conditions. But if you're comparing from different sources, are those less reliable? No, I don't think so. It's pretty standard. It um, okay. All domestic species are tested by the Forest Products Laboratory. Um, and the standards at which those are set out are the same. And the European uh, tests that are done, they use all the same stuff. I mean, this stuff has been around a long, long time. There's really not a lot of variance you're going to find. The variance you will find is in the units. I'm using imperial, uh, imperial numbers here. Um, the biggest one is, is Janka hardness, because you will find uh, pounds per square inch, which I have here, but you'll find kilonewtons um, on uh, some exotic species. Yes? Is there a standard number of samples that they test? In order to yes. I don't know what that is offhand. <laughs> and they tested different parts throughout a board, too, to get a representation. Like a lot of this stuff, it's all mean averages in order to get these numbers. So there's, there's been a lot of scientific white lab coded type people doing stuff for decades and decades to come up with these standards. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that we are ultimately, like I said, the test will be put edge to wood and really go from there. But at least you can get some idea, uh, a ballpark idea by using some of these numbers. And why do we want to get this geeky, you know? It's woodworking, we want to have fun, you know? This is like when I started fly fishing and I started getting in, in, into entomology. And I'm like understanding how many wings are on this bug and like, does that trout care? Probably not, you know? Just cast it nice with no, and it'd be fine. <laughs> you can really go overboard on this and you can start to become the wood nerd, that's what the title is of my, my post, I'm the wood nerd. 
But we want to know how strong is this wood? And strong is a very relative term because that's going to depend upon how the grain was. If it's riven, it's going to be a lot stronger. If it's cross grain, it's going to be weaker than it would be a long grain. But you can tell a lot of the stuff from the numbers and you start to look at stiffness and bending strength to figure out what kind of a span can I get. If I do want to bend this, like I'm steam bending or, or not really bent lamination, but you want to know what is the bending strength. You know, why does um, Bois d'Arc, um, Osage Orange, why, it's called Bois d'Arc, it's bow wood, why does it make great longbows? Because the bending strength, and more importantly, the combination of bending strength and stiffness means that you can bend it a long way without breaking, but the stiffness brings it right back, and you get that incredible force to launch an arrow a long distance. Why do we use red oak? for the bows, or white oak, for the bows of Windsor chairs. Because we know that its bending strength is, is exceptional. And when steam bent, you can get really radical curves out of those things, and you're not going to break. But again, all of this relies upon good grain. You know, you can have all kinds of grain run out and great bending strength and bend that bow of a red oak um, Windsor bow, and it's going to snap on you, especially as you start to dry it. You'll get run out on the back side. So the, all of these things have different variables. This is hopefully going to get us in the ballpark so that if you just, I have no idea what this wood is going to be like, and I'm not ready to drop $6, $8, $12 of board foot on it, this will at least tell me this might help get in the right way. How it's going to cut. We want to know when we actually put it on our workbench, are we going to have tear out with the plane? Is it going to dull our tools? Is it going to be really, really brittle? If I work in really small parts or thin parts, is it going to snap rather than bend? And of course, when we're joining it together, what can my joinery actually stand up to? Like, how thin can I make that tenon? How long can I make that tenon? How difficult will it be to finish and to glue together? You know, species like coca below or teak or highly resinous oily woods always get, pose a little bit of problem because you get that oil and resin barrier between the glue. And it can be, um, you might need to, to clean that off with some sort of mineral spirits before you do that. So really, the elements I want to look at today are the structure of the wood, what does the grain look like, and the hardness. These are used together. They will give you the best picture of how that wood will work. Bending strength and stiffness is all nice, but that really, you know, are we, do we need to bend a lot of our stuff? If you're going to do a lot of bending stuff, then you might need to look at some of those numbers. But for most of us, these three things will give us a really, really good picture. Yes? Uh, one project I'm working on now, I'm using Langy. What in, in that chart would say, this is going to put my uh, hand full of splinters? Excellent. Well done. <laughs> 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 and, and that is an unusual species. Wingi is one of the reasons I put an asterisk on all of this. Because some of the numbers tell me that it shouldn't do this. But when you look at structure and porosity of that, there are a lot of big pores in there. And there's a lot of open grain. And the, the, it wants to shear apart. And actually, you can rive Wingi really easily just by looking at it crooked. It'll snap in half. Um, and that's what just it. All that stuff cleaves away like that because you've got a, a pore structure such that it will really allow that. Now, what's interesting, we've got really, really two things. The two extremes, ring porous and diffuse porous are our two extremes. And somewhere in the middle is what we call semi-diffuse, uh, semi-ring porous, rather. Um, this refers to how the pores in the wood are organized. And I should be clear in saying that this refers to hardwoods only. Softwoods do not have pores. They have tracheids. It's a very different setup. Mostly what we're talking about today is hardwoods, although you will see these numbers applied to softwoods. But there should be like three asterisks next to those because it doesn't really work. Um, a ring porous wood, this is red oak on the far left, has all of your big open pores ordered in neat rings around the trunk. So you have your slow growth stuff during the fall and the winter. And then you have your crazy explosion of growth in the spring and the summer. So the tree is growing really, really fast. And you're getting these wide open vessels, these wide open pores. And then it's slowing down. And you're getting, there's still pores in there, but it's mostly, it's mostly wood stuff. It's mostly cellulose at that point. And when you try to split that wood, it will split right down those nice perforations, nice and clean. That's why red oak is great for riving. It's also why it's really nice to chop into firewood, because it just splits right away. You go to the other extreme, to the diffuse porous. That's hard maple on the far right there. Tiny, tiny little pores, and there's no organization. They're just evenly spaced throughout maple. Now try to split maple. It doesn't work. 
I mean, it will work. If you've ever tried to wedge a dovetail together, it will split. But it doesn't like split in a straight line. It kind of shatters more than anything else. The other thing with hard maple is look at the size of those pores. They're tiny, tiny little pores compared to the big Hawken ones on, on red oak. In the middle, we have walnut. And you can see there's kind of this, this gradient. We've got wide open pores down here, and then they get a little bit smaller, and then they go really, really small, and then they get a little bit more medium and then big. And it's, it's almost a, 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 a spectrum of diffuse there's not that clean delineation from wide open from early wood to late wood like you would find in, in a red oak or other ring pore species. This will tell me right away, A, this wood, if it has wide open pores, it's going to compress a little bit more. There's more dead air in that structure so that if I try to wedge a dovetail together, there's space that those really thick, dense fibers can compress into but it also will split very readily. Um, on a diffuse porous wood, there's just not a lot there. You can't really compress that. You try to compress maple. You fit maple dovetails together, and if you left that line, you might have some problems. You're probably gonna need to split that line or maybe even remove the line. So that is, is personified right here by looking at the ingrained structure. This. On the far right, we've got diffuse porous. Cherry is a diffuse porous species. Walnut, we actually see pictured in the middle as a semi-ring porous. This is why, despite the fact that cherry and walnut have almost identical Janka hardness ratings, walnut feels easier to work. It also looks cool and smells great, but it's also really expensive. So walnut, I love both walnut and cherry, but I love working with walnut. And all of those other numbers almost exactly line up except for the structure. And because of the fact that I've got some more wide open pores, I've got a little bit of compression that can happen. I've got a little bit lower shearing force because there's a lower density to the whole thing because you've got more dead air in there. That in and of itself, the structure telling me a ring porous or semi-ring porous and diffuse porous will tell me right away that this is going to be a little bit easier to work. This might be a little bit harder. I might get more tear out. And it, it's also probably going to be a lot harder to chop through, things like that, because there's not as much space to compress into. I think, honestly, this is like the number one thing. We could just call it quits. You can walk out of here. Um, because looking at the structure like here, it tells us so many things. Can we split it? How is that going to split? Do I have to worry about it splitting? Do I have to leave the line or keep the line? Isn't that really the most important thing in getting joiner to fit? You know, do I use a pencil? Do I use a knife? You know, what do I do with the line? How far to the one side of the line do I cut over the other? That's, that's like the key to, to good fitting joinery. This will tell you that, whether or not it will compress on you. We look at it as open grain and closed grain, right? When we're talking about finishing, this is another thing. Do I have to fill the pores? You know, do I want grain filling when I finish this if I'm going to do a high French polish or something? You try to French polish oak, you got to fill that grain try to French polish mahogany, you've got to fill the grain because you've got open, bigger pores. What we're concerned about, is it hard or is it soft? And that, that has to do some of this, but it also has to do with those Janka hardness tests. And that's one of our three elements, is the hardness number. Um, but more important than that, I think, is what does that grain look like? Is it straight grain, spiraled, interlocked, wavy, irregular? Does it have any luster? And what is the texture of that grain? These are all elements to look at. Um, Straight grain, obviously, the grain all flows one direction. It's nice and pretty. Red oak, it all flows in one direction. Um, most of our domestics are this way. When they're not, they tend to be spiral grain where it wraps around the tree. You can get this also with just trees growing in unusual situations on hillsides and things like that where the grain will lean away from gravity trying to fight the pull of gravity and sometimes it will spiral around. You get trees in high windswept areas, you will get spiral, gra or spiral gravity, spiral grain because it's constantly fighting to stay upright. So the grain will respond to the stresses on that, that tree wanting to try to topple it. For the most part, straight grain tells us this is going to be pretty easy to plane, it's going to be pretty easy to work with. Um, obviously I tend to lead towards the hand tool side of things, but this really does apply across all hand and power tools. Spiral you know, you might have to switch directions every now and then. You might have to pay a little bit more attention to the direction you're running it through the router table or running that hand plane over it. You also will notice that it might tend to be a little bit blotchy when you finish it because your grain is spiraling around and every now and then you're going to get some ingrain pop up and then it's going to dive back down. That's where you can get some really cool chatoyancy effects on our wood too. Not quite to the extent of like curly figure and things like that. Is there, a, what's an example of wood that, that typically grows with spiral grain? 
Uh, white oak will do it in high windswept areas. Um, uh, what's the, uh, all the fruit woods. Oh, like apple. Yeah, okay. apple, pear. Um, <laughs> but there's another one of those weird examples because pear, dogwood, dogwood's really spiral. You cannot split dogwood, which is another thing. If it's straight grain, it's going to cleave apart really easily. If it's spiral, if it splits, it's going to do this weird thing and oh. jive around. Try to split dogwood. That's why we use dogwood for, for wedges when you're trying to split a log because yeah, it just I, doesn't I, split. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cherry is not. Cherry is a straight grain. Yeah. Okay, but it does have the blotchy problem. Yeah. And it is a fruit wood. That's something else altogether. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shh. Quiet you. No. Um, but th that's a great example. And, and fruit woods, European pear is possibly the greatest wood to work. It's the most like homogenous species you work. It cuts like frozen butter, hard butter. <laughs> But I mean, it's, it's really a great wood to work, and it's got all kinds of weird grain stuff going on in there. So there's always going to be exceptions to the rule. But then again, you know, European pear is kind of hard to get, too. So you're going to have more time, harder time finding it than worrying about what, what our various species are, or what our various technical um, elements are. The interlocked grain is found, obviously, in the most of our exotic species where you're going to have grain overlapping one another, running one direction in one growth ring and running the other direction in the other growth ring. Um, pretty much all your mahoganies, and I mean that in the most generic marketing sense possible because we just love to put mahogany on everything because it sells. It has nothing to do with the sweet tina genus of mahogany. It could be seven other genuses, but we call it mahogany. They all have that interlocked grain, and that will also account for a lot of that um, Ribbon striping we see in Sapili, you'll even see ribbon or rowy grain in genuine mahogany. Certainly the wavy grain in, in African mahogany, the Kaya genus, it's all because of that interlocked nature. Because it's, you know, and if you, if you look at the board this way, ooh, that looks pretty, and you turn and you look this way and go, whoa, what just happened? Like it totally changed on me, which is another thing to think about when you're designing that piece of furniture. I have a tool cabinet in my shop with African mahogany panels. And when I look at it this way, it looks really, really cool. There's like these great pinstripes of the side. And then I come over and I look at it this way, and it's like, well, they all went away. You know, the, the pinstripes went away. Which is why, if you're watching in my videos, I always film from this angle, because it <laughs> looks cooler. It looks much, much cooler. Um, wavy grain is the generic term for some of the, the, the curl that we're going to see. Um, you know, to its most, most extreme, the fiddleback kind of tiger maple type look, where the grain is really crenulated. Um, Cherry is straight but wavy. That's why you get blotching in cherry. Um, curly cherry is actually not really the same thing. Like when you buy curly maple and curly cherry, just looking at them, you'll see that it's a little bit wavier in the cherry. And you've got actual, I, I like the word crenellations, in tiger maple. I mean, it's this really intense curl. Cherry never really it does get there because it's wood and crazy stuff happens. But for the most part, cherry. Curly cherry is not that hard to find, actually. Just rub some finish on it. You'd be surprised. Most of the cherry we buy has that blotchy nature to it because it's wavy. The grain itself is wavy. Um, it is still straight, meaning it's all kind of running the same direction, but it's taking the scenic route to get there. Um, irregular grain, it's, it's, that's the, um, we don't know what to call it. This is the miscellaneous pile. It goes one way here and shoots off this way. Uh, we could look at that as like parts of a tree, like crotch and branch wood. Usually the irregular grain is representative of some external force, like it grew on the side of a hill. Or uh, the irregular grain you get from um, Seattle lumber yards from the mid 80s, because it all has ash from Mount St. Helens impregnated into it, and it will eat your blades. You know, it's like, wow, this is beautiful white oak. And it has a jank of hardness of like six times that of regular white oak, because it's filled with pumice and ash. And you don't have to fill that grain. You use it to fill the grain of others. It's an abrasive board. But that, that is, that is a, uh, an outside force that has been acted upon that wood to create an irregular grain. Um, mostly, we're talking about growth defects and splits, crotch, and things like that that creates the irregular grain. There are some species, and technically, we could consider something like um, hornbeam or boxwood to be an irregular grain species because it kind of goes, goes all over the place. In those particular instances, it makes a very, very dense, very, very hard wood, but also a real pleasure to work with 
because you kind of don't know which way the, the grain is running, and it kind of cancels each other out. You know, it's, it's just this homogenous block of forces acting on one another, and it actually ends up being quite stable. That's why we like to use boxwood. You know, it's really, really hard, but we use boxwood for um, boxing in planes and things like that, or for even um, running surfaces. Uh, like, you're not going to use boxwood for your drawer runners. I suppose you could. <laughs> what a waste of boxwood. But it, 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 it's just so um, stable. I guess is the word for it, because the grain kind of doesn't know which way it's going. It's in a regular grain. Um, luster and texture, they do refer to grain, but not so much in how it's going to work, but things like how is it going to finish? Um, am I going to have to fill those pores? Uh, am I going to have trouble planing this, like in Douglas fir, where the texture is coarse, because the hardness difference between your early wood and your late wood is so dramatic, and as it weathers, it actually gets that washboard effect because the soft stuff just, just erodes away. And you know, there's nothing you can do to fill the pores of, well, you can't fill the pores of Douglas fir because there are no pores in Douglas fir, but you get the idea. Smoothing out and getting a perfectly glossy surface in Douglas fir will only work for about the first year. And then it's going to have that washboard effect just because the softness distance, the differences is so dramatic. Um, the texture is, is irregular at best. Open poured woods are going to said, be said to have more texture because you're going to have a hard time getting a high gloss on it because you've got more texture in those wide open pores. Um, luster, woods will have natural luster. Ebony has very, very high luster. Cocoa below has high luster. This will also start to get into, you were asking about the extractives, right? How do we know if it glues together? That's a, an indication as well. If it has a high luster, if it's naturally shiny and it polishes really, really nice, not only does it have a really, really dense structure, but more than likely there's some extra stuff in there. You know, how do we polish stuff? Well, you can put it on a buffing wheel, but it polishes better if you put compound on that buffing wheel. Think of those extractives as your compound. Um, teak has a waxy luster to it because of the oils in teak. But if you take a buffing wheel to teak, man, it's gorgeous. Better be it. $45 a board foot, <laughs> if you're lucky, $45 a board foot. This year, wait till next year, it'll be a lot worse. Um, now, hardness, this is the one we kind of all know. I think this is the one most people are familiar with. The Jenka test, as I said before, you're taking a steel ball, 0.44 inches, half inch, steel ball, and you're pressing it into the face grain of the board to half its depth. The amount of pressure, force, required to do that is your Jenka number. Uh, cherry, 980 pounds per square inch. Walnut, 970 pounds per square inch. Hard maple, 1426 pounds per square inch. White oak is 15 something. Red oak is 12 something. Right off the bat, those are species that a lot of us have experience with. And you can look at it and go, yeah, it yeah, makes sense. Maple's damn hard. You know, white oak is damn hard. It's actually harder than maple, but it actually works better because it's ring porous. It's got more space for stuff to compress into. So the hardness, all of these factors, the Jenka number, your density numbers, your specific gravity numbers, even to some respect, your modulus of elasticity, your stiffness number, all play into how hard is a species of wood. And the reason I list all of those, all four of those, is because you should always be able to find Jenka. If you can't find it, just do like a, a you could literally Google Jenka for species X. A lot of times you'll land on a, on a flooring website because flooring companies use all kinds of different species and hardness is a big deal, you know, for walking on it all day long and, you know, can I lay down this floor and can the ladies walk by in their um, high heels without destroying it? That's, believe it or not, that's something that flooring people want to know. Um, so that should be easy to find. Density and specific gravity are sometimes not always both present. Present, a lot of times those numbers can also be very similar as well. Modulus of elasticity, um, I throw that in there just because I know a lot of people are concerned about can I span such a distance? How much deflection am I going to see in that? And a lot of that is directly related to just how dense that wood is. How much empty space can that wood compress into as I'm pushing on it? Uh, MOE will also tell you, again, some of those numbers like do I leave the line or take the line as I'm, as I'm cutting this away. All four of those things together really will give you a good picture. You're just going to, again, who cares what the number is, but when you compare it against the species that you do know, and 
the perfect example that I said earlier was cherry and walnut. Cherry and walnut have almost the same Jenka hardness number. Of density of walnut is 0.5 something, 0.54 I think. Cherry is 0.59. So it's more, it's denser than walnut, which again accounts for the fact that walnut actually is a little bit easier to plane. It's a lot easier to chop mortises into, or you know your your router bit or your router motor doesn't quite scream as hard when you plunge real deep into it. Um, the specific gravity numbers are about the same. Cherry has a higher specific gravity than walnut. So even though the Janka hardness is almost identical, and actually I think when you convert to um, metric, there's some rounding errors in there, and it actually is listed as identical on some sites. Because um, like it falls within the deviation curve, the allowable deviation. So most people refer to them as the same hardness. The density numbers tell a different story, though. It tells me that walnut is actually easier to work than cherry. I throw stability in here. This is really, as I say, it's more of an FYI when you build. Um, if you have a really unstable wood, that is some indication of other things like is there a lot of different varying grain in it? Does it have interlock grain? Um, do you have a lot of density variations within it? But mostly, we just want to make sure that our projects don't blow up. You know, we don't have cross grain situations. The thing that you can look at. Obviously, tangential movement, that's across the grain. That's our flats on boards and causing them to cup. Radial movement is very minimal. That's why we like quarters on boards. That's uh, uh, perpendicular to the grain uh, along the medullary rays, which if you don't know, the medullary rays run like axles on a, on a wheel into the center. That's what feeds the tree. The sap wood brings up all the nutrients and sugars, and they, channel, they travel through medullary rays to the center of the tree. And get deposited there. That's a nice way of putting for tree excrement. Um, that's what makes heartwood darker. It's tree waste, you know, because it comes through those medullary rays. Medullary rays are jam-packed full of stuff. They're highly, highly dense, and they're working radially out from the tree, which is what is, it's like structure. It's, it's um, the studs in the wall that keep that wall from collapsing upon itself, and that's why the movement in the radial direction is very, very low. The thing to look at is the TR ratio, the tangential to radial number. Most websites, most places like the Wood Database and my website will give you a TR number. And you can look at that and it'll be you know, 1.6, 2.1, or in the case of ePay, 1. ePay is almost entirely, almost entirely isometric, which is why it makes a great decking wood, because you can stick it out in the sun and in the rain and everything and it won't warp and buckle on you because it has a TR ratio. It's technically 1.03. It's one. Um, but then you look at things like um, beach. Hand plane, wooden plane makers, like greatest mecca of wood for plane. It's one of the most unstable woods you'll ever see. Uh, 2.6, I think, is the TR ratio. It's just like, what the heck? Like it's moving twice across the, the tangential than it is across the radial, but yet we use it to make planes. But you know, this is the other thing you look at. I tend to think we overstate wood movement a lot, too. I have some strong opinions on this. Wood does move. You need to build for it, but we don't have to be afraid of it. I have a, I have a, a blog on the McElvain website that says, wood, wood moves, get over it. You know, just <laughs> st stop freaking out about it. Recognize that it's going to move on you, and just build accordingly. So I wanted to look at some case studies. I've kind of already alluded here. Um, but this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the exercise that you can take away from this by looking at these numbers and looking at a species that you have personal firsthand working experience with. If you're stuck in that rut and all you're working with is pine, and I actually have pine as an example here, um, how do I find some woods that aren't going to you know, kill me when I try to work with them and not going to frustrate me and make me have buyer's remorse because I just spent all this money on it? Or I spent all this money on it, and I don't want to screw it up. How do I know what I'm getting myself into? So when we look at cherry versus walnut, cherry is diffuse versus semi-ring porous of walnut. So that should tell me that walnut automatically should be a little bit easier to work. It should compress a little bit more on me. They are both straight grain, so that's a, a nice wash. Um, oh, my number's are wrong. Sorry, my memory's failing. 950 versus 1010. But that in and of itself, look at that. Cherry is softer than walnut according to the pressing the steel ball into it, but yet because of the ring porous, semi-ring porous nature, it's easier to work. Um, and it has a smooth versus medium texture, 
which is also an indication of um, how difficult is it going to be to plane, how much is it going to splinter, can I cut really, really fine details um, without it like breaking off, if I'm running a router over the edge, do I need to take a lower feed rate or take off less of a bite because it might splinter a little bit more, Cherry won't because of its very smooth texture. In this case, the porosity trumps the hardness because they both are very, very similar in a lot of ways. But I don't think anybody can deny the fact that when you sit down to chop a mortise in walnut, it feels easier than chopping a mortise in cherry. And the point that I want to make with these two, comparing these two, is I do think they make good control species. Not only because of the fact that cherry and walnut are pretty readily available here in North America, a lot of us, we love them. It's great furniture woods, right? Most of us have some experience working with them. So it's a, you've got to, you can use this as your control. I now, when I want to figure out what tuna ciliatus works like, Australian yellow cedar, I can compare it to cherry or I can compare it to walnut. That's my control. Not to get too scientific here. Um, another good example, the mahoganies. Yes, they're in the same botanical family, but they are different genus and different species, but we call them mahogany. Mahogany versus kaya, or African mahogany. <clears throat> and if you don't know, African mahogany is actually a marketing term. It is not an actual species of wood. Or it's what we refer to as a conglomerate species. There are about 20 different African mahoganies, all under the Kaya genus with different species name. Intheteca, Senegalensis, Ivorensis, all those fun things. Most people can't identify the difference between them and they all get shoved in the same shipping container and they end up on your, your rack as African mahogany. So that's why when you pick up one board and you pick up another board and they're dramatically different density, dramatically different colors, one works like crap and the other one looks fantastic, you know, because they're just all crammed together. African mahogany grows over such an enormous geographic range that the soil chemistry from one end of that range to the other creates almost an entirely different wood. It's really annoying that way. Um, if you've got a good lumber yard and you can go to them and say, do you carry Kaya ivorensis from the Ivory Coast region? Do you carry Kaya senegalensis from the Senegal Ghana region? And they can say, yes, you want to buy from them because those, the, those are the cream of the crop species. It's the Kaya entheteca that has given African mahogany a bad name. Anybody who's had a bad Kaya experience is because they ended up with something like Kaya entheteca from the Congo or a Democratic Republic of the Congo, something like that. The number of lumber yards that are going to be able to answer that question is probably four. <laughs> We're one of them, I will tell you that. So let's, let's look at these. They are both diffuse porous but they do have different pore sizes. So again, it's not just what's the ordering of those pores, what's the size of those pores. Cherry and maple are a good example. Maple has smaller pores than cherry. Not that much smaller, but again, that may also help contribute to the extra hardness of that species. Here, in this case, mahogany has much bigger pores than kaya. And you can see the density number, or the Jenka numbers down here. Our genuine mahogany, Sweetina macrophylla, is an 800 pounds per square inch rating versus 1370. It is because of that pore size that does that. There's more dead air in mahogany. Mahogany is straight-ish. Um, it, it's technically it is an interlocked grain, but it acts like a straight grain because it's just lovely. Um, it's it be, good genuine mahogany is growing in a nice controlled rainforest environment where it's the same all year round. You really don't have early and late wood in genuine mahogany because it's just hot and wet all the time when mahogany grows, where most mahogany grows. Mexican mahogany, not quite so much. But the stuff that we like, what we generically call Honduran mahogany, even though it hasn't been from Honduras in about 50 years, Cuban mahogany, it's illegal, but you know, those key areas, and even now, Fiji mahogany. Fiji actually, botanists tell you that it actually, why didn't it grow here naturally? Because it grows better in Fiji than it actually did in Honduras and in Central America. Um, they just need to figure out how to dry it now. That would be a whole other issue. So we have very little early to late wood transition in genuine mahogany, but in African mahogany, although it's not a big transition, your interlock grain and your larger pore size will create that striated appearance you see. Kaya's on the bottom, Genuine's on top. And that top picture is really green. Does it look like that way? It doesn't look that way on my screen. Huh. Um, so they both have a relatively low density. It's like 0.44 and 0.45, I think. Um, but you can see a dramatic hardness difference. And that really attributes the grain is what creates that hardness differential. The 
open pore size and the interlocked grain is creating a little bit more space in between the fibers in African mahogany than you will find in a very homogenous species. That's why we love to carve genuine mahogany um, because it's, well, the 800 Jenka hardness is nice too, uh, but it's, it's, it's almost a, a completely homogenous species the way the grain is structured together and the pore size is being small enough. So these are also two good species to look at because I think kaya, even though they're both exotic species, I think kaya makes a good representation of the African species in general. And there's a lot of African species and even the Indonesian and Asian species, this can be a good control species for you. Um, you can also get it a lot more readily. And a lot of people have worked with it and a lot of people have had outstanding results and really, really poor results. And a lot of people have worked with genuine mahogany, even if it's just a small piece. And anybody who's worked with genuine mahogany goes, man, this stuff is awesome. I love this. Anybody who's worked with genuine mahogany goes, this stuff is terrible. It's because you didn't get genuine mahogany. It's because somebody said, we have mahogany, and they sold you African mahogany instead. <clears throat> so we're going to use our control species cherry and compare it against hard maple. Again, two species that we're going to run into a lot. Oftentimes, we might use hard maple as a secondary species, as a drawer side to that cherry drawer front. They are both diffuse. They are both straight grain, but man, 950 versus 1450, that's a pretty huge difference. And then your texture, <laughs> smoother versus smooth. They're, they're pretty much the same in all outward appearances, but obviously hard maple is substantially harder. Now, I didn't list the density numbers here because <laughs> maple is also a conglomerate species. We say hard maple and soft maple. Well, there's no such thing as soft maple. That's a marketing term. There's red maple, there's silver maple, there's rock maple, and there's sugar maple, and there's big leaf maple, and there's Norway maple, and I'm forgetting 12 of them at least. But they tend to get lumped into, we have a soft maple and a hard maple because the red maples are softer at about nine, um, no, 980 I think, versus 1450. There's a dramatic difference in softness between soft maple and hard maple. Um, <clears throat> so the density numbers tend to be a range when you look at maple density, you'll see like 0.42 to like 0.6 something. And well, that doesn't help me. So this is an area where you kind of have to throw that number out because you're not, unless you can I quantitatively identify that this is Norway maple or it's red maple or it's hard or rock maple or something, it's probably a good idea to just not look at that. Because what we're really looking at here, even though everything else is the same, the Janka hardness number is our definer. And that pore size, in a lot of ways, contributes to that. The smaller pores and the denser packed pores of hard maple, and if you look at the end grain of maple, you can actually see this. You don't have to have a hand lens to see it. It's just really, really tightly packed. And you know, run a block plane over your, um, your cherry, it's still really, really tiny pores, but they're much more spaced out than you will find in hard maple. And that's what contributes to the really, really hard nature of hard maple. If you were to look up the shearing strength of hard maple, you're going to find that it's twice that of cherry. And you try to hand plane hard maple and you'll get tear out because it just doesn't, there's no, there's no place for it to go. There's so much force fighting back on you because there's so much of that dense cellulose material between the pores locking it all together. Cherry is going to have a little bit, this again is kind of like the difference between um, a hand filed saw or a hand stitched rasp and a machine cut rasp. Cherry keeps you guessing because the pores are a little bit scattered all over the place. So, you know, you're fighting against hard cellulose material, but then you get a nice little open pore and then you're fighting against it. Maple is just kind of all hard cellulose material. The pores are so small that they're almost not even there in that case. And that definitely contributes to the difference in making hard maple such a beast to work with, with, at least with hand planes anyway. I don't even use hard maple anymore. I use soft maple for everything. So now we look at, from a domestic perspective, these are kind of our hard, hard woods. You know, domestically, you, you can certainly find harder woods than this, but for most of us, we're looking at the oaks and hard maples, and white oak is harder than red oak. In this case, red oak, or white oak, is rather very ring porous, and hard maple, as we already know, is very diffuse porous. They're both very straight grain, yet white oak is actually softer on the Janker rating than hard maple is. And that's because of the fact that it's ring porous, it's got big wide open pores. The other thing about that is white oak pores 
This is another little rabbit hole to fall down. But white oak pores are filled with a substance called tylose. It's kind of like caulk, which is why white oak makes a great exterior species and red oak does not make a great exterior species. Because red oak pores are wide open, like wave in the back of the room. I can see. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever seen Roy Underhill where he blows through it and blows bubbles in the cup of water? Yeah. You can't do that with white oak because the tylose in those pores gums it all up. And it stops it up and it makes it an excellent exterior species. Red oak, not so much. Um, but that doesn't really affect our workability of it. What we're talking about in this case is all about that pore structure. Um, white oak, every, most everything, density and everything on those two species is almost identical. But oaks in general are going to be easier to work than hard maple because there's got more compression strength. That is why when I listed those elements, I listed porosity first. I think that's your single most important thing to look at. What is that actual pore structure of the wood? Because that will tell you more than anything how easy is that to chop, to saw, to plane, to route, to, to whatever. So now let's look at some softwoods. There's no pore structure in softwoods. You can look at, at pine. There was a piece of pine in here. Well, it doesn't matter. You can look at pine and you can see what you think are pores. And those are actually called tracheids and they're a totally different structure. But you can also look at it and you can very clearly see early and late growth. You can see the stripes in white pine or the stripes in Douglas fir, um, cedar even. You'll see those darker pieces of the, the um, more dense wood and the wider, lighter pieces and less dense pieces. Pieces? Pieces? And it's, it's in, indic indicated right here. You can see those lines. That is really what is going to make the biggest difference in softwoods. That's kind of, even though there aren't pores, that's kind of your, your, your indicator. So I look at white pine and Douglas fir, and I see in white pine a very homogenous structure. Look at that top piece there. There is differences there. You can see the stripes, but it's much less pronounced. They're also more evenly set across that board. When you look at the Douglas fir below, it's pretty dramatic. And that actually, that's looking weird too. Douglas fir is very pink because those um, dense lines are very dense and they actually come out very, very pink. And the wood in between, the hardness difference between those, unfortunately no one's going to give you Jenkin numbers you know, from the soft stuff and the hard stuff because you can't really stick a half inch ball between them. But you'll find that the, the more dramatic striping, striated appearance of Douglas fir, well, I mean, we may find that very cool looking, that actually makes Douglas fir a lot harder to work, and you can see that reflected in the Jenkin number, 380 versus 710. Douglas fir is almost as hard as cherry, and, that and, and, and harder than poplar. And so people are like, well, I want to use you know, softwoods, or I want to practice my dovetails on a softwood. <laughs> Don't do it on Douglas fir. It's evil. Not, not good stuff. So in that instance, the grain differences change the working properties of this. And Douglas fir ends up being so much harder to work. At the same time, though, if you look at structural numbers, some of the more esoteric technical specs, specs you'll see that Douglas fir is ridiculously strong. That's why we use it in timber framing. Span numbers, stiffness numbers, um, design value numbers on Douglas fir are off the charts. And white pine is in the basement. You do not want to frame. Of course, we use white pine all the time to make studs, don't we? But that's a collective thing. More studs, the stronger the wall, right? You can frame an entire barn you know, with a single A-frame of two Douglas fir beams, and you're perfectly strong. You can span 30, 40, 50 foot distances with a, a single Douglas fir beam. That might be a 12 by 12 or a 20 by 20. You can even scarf join it together, and you know that the stiffness and the strength of that fir, because of that hardness, because of that, that really the skeleton of Douglas fir is so unbelievably hard and generally very straight as well uh, along the wood. So I, I feel like we needed to throw a softwood in there because we all work with softwoods, but a lot of the stuff from a pore structure doesn't really help you. But you can look at just the striping pattern on them and be able to tell the difference there. So now we'll grab one of our control species, cherry, and we'll look at it versus dogwood. And we talked about the weird nature of, of fruit woods, although you really can't call dogwood a fruit wood. I don't know what you call dogwood. It acts like a fruit wood. A what wood? A canine wood. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that was it. It's a biblical wood. Um, they are, they're both diffuse. Uh, you will find that dogwood has much smaller pores and more, very much like maple in its structure. But you can see 950 versus 2150 Janka hardness. 
So that in and of itself, I can look at those numbers and I can say, oh, I just, you know, my neighbor took down a dogwood tree. I want to mill it up and work with it. Let me start looking at these numbers. And immediately, the first thing I'm, I'm going to look at is the pore structure. Then I'm looking at the Jenka hardness. And I look at that and go, ooh, that's going to be painful. You know, I don't know whether I, I want to work with that. And then you start looking at the grain, and cherry's got a very straight grain, and dogwood is very, very interlocked. Then I start thinking, well, it's really hard. It's really interlocked, which means it's not going to split on me. I'll make some wedges out of it. You know? Or I will make uh, a bearing surface out of it. I'll use dogwood to stole the bottom of my hand plane, because it's going to resist uh, um, warping, it's going to be really, really hard to work with. If I need a running surface or a pressure surface or something like that, dogwood actually make a really good uh, species for that, which is also good too because you're not going to get huge pieces of dogwood. So it makes great, uh, great plane bottoms, although it's kind of pink. It's not really manly. <laughs> you want that black ebony, Macassar ebony sole. Um, so if we look at the density numbers here though, and I haven't really, oh, actually that's specific gravity, but Again, I, I interchange density and specific gravity pretty much um, all the time. But you can see cherry at 0.47 versus 0.64. And if anybody doesn't know, on specific gravity, one is water. And one and anything above one means it will sink. And we all know from the Salem witch trials that wood floats, right? Um, unless it's lignum vitae or ipe or kumaru or any of those weird species that have a, have a specific gravity of 1.6 and above or one, anything above one. So in this particular instance, we have similar species, even from an appearance perspective. I mean, dog, our, uh, dogwood is, is certainly pinker. You're not going to have as much of the, the dark and light striations of early and late growth in there. Um, but face value, they can look very, very similar. From the yin grain, they look very, very similar. But dog, dogwood, why do I keep wanting to call it Douglas fir? Dogwood is the super hard version of cherry very, 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 very tough. Um, and density and Jenka are the two numbers that really tell us that. Even though everything else tends to be the same, I can look at those two numbers and without ever even working at dogwood, know kind of what I'm getting into, what it's going to work like. It's going to work like cherry on crack, you know, with really, really hard <laughs> cherry on steroids, I guess. Does crack make you harder or softer? I would think probably softer. Maybe we shouldn't do that. It's a little less predictable, maybe. So what I want, what what we're what we're leading up to here is, how do we apply this? If we have Hoopelstein and McGinty Road, what are the working properties of them, and how do how do we know when we start looking those things up? So let's pick a control species. Let me see if I can do this here. If you're looking for stuff like this. The best thing you can do is go to uh, the wood database. I suppose I should turn the Wi-Fi on. Um, wood database is a fantastic website for this. It will give you the actual technical numbers, but at the same time, it will also give you um, kind of real-world descriptions, not just numerical numbers. But well, I kind of never remember. Is it wood-database.com? Let's just Google it. Wood-database. Wood -database. There it is. So um, this will give you more anecdotal descriptions as well instead of just numbers. You can see the numbers up at the top here. And you can get your Janka hardness numbers. And it's going to give you both PSI and Newton's pounds force. But then you scroll down here, and you can get this more anecdotal evidence. It will tell you, you know, how easy is it to work. And well, rot resistance is a good one, too, when it comes to do I have to clean the surface before I apply glue or finish. Um, what is the end grain? That's where we're getting our porous. You can see on Madrone, we're looking at semi-ring porous versus or diffuse porous. And it tells you um, the grouping of the pores, the size of the pores. And you usually can scroll down here, and you've got your end grain photos, and you've got your face grain photos. Um, you've even got irregular photos, like burl down here. So this, this is kind of your one-stop place to go. Um, I actually find that as much as the numbers up in this part here are really great, the um, paragraph stuff actually ends up being a little bit better. Before you move on, could you just uh, interpret what it says in rot resistance there? Where was that? Up, uh, uh, right there. 
Madrone is rated as non-durable to perishable with regard to decay resistance. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, um, it means that you don't want to use it outside, frankly. Um, if, it's, if it's listed as durable, um, it will often also say um, rot, rot resistance or certain amount of rot resistance. Perishable is the opposite of rot resistance. Um, bugs like it, in other words. That's really what causes rot. A question in the back. I don't mean to sidetrack the rot resistance, but you bring up something that intrigued me. I was at the giant box store, and they were labeling pine as rot resistance. And I thought that was kind of funny because it's really not. <laughs> and, you know, all of you use finger joint stuff for outdoor trip. Not a great idea. Right. From your experience, are you seeing that just as a marketing thing? Because if I recall historically, old growth Yes. And the play to that, is that accurate? What you're talking about with old growth tight grain pine, those dark, dense lines, that's all resin. And the resin is like very bitter to the bugs. When we're talking about rot resistance, is do the bugs like it or do they turn their noses up at it? So um, pine is very resinous. You know, you take some green pine and run it over your tools and you get that pitch building up in your saw blades and your planes get all gummy on the bottom. So Yes, it's a little bit of marketing, but there's some truth to that. The problem is you go to Home Depot and you see the growth rings this wide apart and all the stuff in between that, that dark line is not rot resistant. So what it should say is, you know, between one and 5% rot resistant, that's what it should say. But yeah, the, the old growth stuff absolutely is. And Douglas fir, I would consider to be rot resistant. The incredibly hard and resinous nature of those really hard bones of the Douglas fir that makes it so strong and makes it so difficult to plane, they're also quite prevalent throughout the board. You don't have as much, you know, even wide old or fast growth Douglas fir still has a lot of that streaking in it as compared to something like New England white pine. Um, so it, they're, it's not an outright lie, <laughs> put it that way, which in the marketing world is okay. <laughs> <laughs> Where compared to those two with yellow pine? Yellow pine is very rot resistant. Yes, um, it's highly resinous. Yellow pine is also quite hard. Um, your again, same type of deal with Douglas fir. Your um, your dense stuff, the streaks in it, are much closer together and also very very hard. You're going to have a lot of the similar issues. Although I do find yellow pine to be easier to work than Douglas fir, because it tends to be a little bit denser. Um, you're not bouncing, you know, from the hard part to the hard part, which using Douglas fir as an example for rot resistance, if you make that stuff even closer together in yellow pine, you have it even more rot resistant, which is what's unusual because that's what they use for pressure treated lumber. So is it really even necessary? I mean, yes, it makes it even more rot resistant. One of the reasons we're using uh, southern yellow pine for pressure treated lumber is just because it's incredible prevalence. It's just everywhere in the south. I mean, mostly we're going to be talking really yellow birch. I mean, that's what, when we carry yellow birch, it's that um, 1260. So I must have been thinking beech. So from a hardness perspective, it's comparable to red oak and hardness. But it's actually going to be, workability-wise, a heck of a lot harder. So let's use that as our example. We know that red oak has a Janka hardness of 12 something, 1280, I think. In this case, we're looking at the Jenka hardness of birch as 1260. But if we, and we know that red oak is ring porous. We saw that actual image up there, very ring porous, wide open pores, order and structure. When we look at birch, it's diffuse porous, primarily radial multiples, medium pores, and no specific arrangement. So then I'll scroll down even further and look at the ingrain. This looks a lot like that example of maple we saw earlier. Very tiny pores and jam packed together. So even though the hardness technically is the same, when we look at the grain structure, the porosity, remember I said that's the one you should look at first? That tells me that that's going to be a hell of a lot harder to work than the red oak is. But it also tells me that it's going to hold details really well. Anybody who's worked with red oak and they have it splinter on the edge when you run that router bit along it, you're not going to get that with birch because it's a lot denser. And the more homogenized structure, let's look at the density numbers. 
Sisu gravity 0.55 dry. They don't list a density. Yeah. So uh, red oak is 0.4 something. So again, you're seeing a dramatic difference in the specific gravity or density, and you're seeing a huge difference in the porosity, even though your Jenka hardness numbers are almost the same. So this is why you kind of have to look at all of those elements together, porosity, grain structure, hardness. They all kind of have to be looked at because you're going to get things that are similar and you can't just assume it's going to be the same. And good example. Well done. You win a gold star. Um, I want to go to Wingy. So let's go look that up. Just because there are weird things about Wingy. W comes before. There it is. So if we were to use, that's the other thing. It's nice to use kind of similar species. So um, if I were to compare red oak to wingy, red oak is a ring porous wood. Wingy is a diffuse porous wood. So let's take a diffuse porous wood and compare apples to apples. So we'll look at maple. Maple's diffuse porous has got a hardness of 1460. The Janko hardness of wingy is 1930. So OK. <laughs> Wingate is going to be a lot harder. So why is it that it splinters when you look at it? Why does it split so easily? Let's look at the grain. It's diffuse pores, large pores in, a spe in no specific arrangement. Solitary and radial multiples of two to three. Don't really pay attention to the. You can have pores that are grouped together. You can have pores that, that are loners, solitary or radial. You can also have um, clusters of pores. What you could just think of that cluster of pore as one pore. But the other thing to look at is if you have multiple pores grouped together, that's still more dead space, right? That's still more dead air inside there that's going to compress, or it's going to act like perforations in you know, printer paper. I'm dating myself. But when you pull the little edges off the end of the printer paper, you're going to have perforations in Wingy, and that's why it splinters. That's why it doesn't hold those edge details as well. That's why when you pick it up, you go, ow, damn it, there's splinters in my hand. Um, everything else, 1930 Janka hardness, that's really hard. But because the, the glue that holds it all together, because the pores are, are, are larger, you're going to run into those issues where it actually, in some ways, works, works easier than something like maple. In this case, easier is not good, I think, when it comes to wingate because it does splinter so easily. Because I mean, you try turning wingate, and I mean, working across the grain, it's just stuff flying everywhere, and you can't get the details to hold on that. But maple, man, you know, we use maple for Windsor chair legs because it holds really, really fine details, and you get really thin on it as well. Yes? I thought it was interesting that it said that the splinters can cause infection. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wood is, uh, um, she said it's interesting because the splinters can cause infection. Wood is actually quite toxic most of the time to us. Yeah, severe reactions are quite uncommon. Breathing wingate wood dust can cause central nervous system effects, abdominal cramps, <laughs> irritation of the skin, eyes, and death. <laughs> Do not taunt wingate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we, yeah, yeah. Don't get caught in a dark alley with Wingate. It will be. <laughs> Another thing you can look at on this site is the workability section. It says it can be difficult to work with hand and machine tools. It blunts tool edges. Now, you're going to hear this a lot. There's a lot of woods that say, oh, this blunts tool edges, and we tend to run in fear. People are terrified of teak. It's going to destroy my joiner. I love teak. Teak is actually one of the nicer woods to work, with the exception of the price tag. Um, it, it planes beautifully. It cuts beautifully. It's practically self-lubricating because it's so oily. But yeah, it has a lot of silica content. But you know what? That's what sharpening's for. You, know, you may have to sharpen a little bit more. I actually find the higher oil content of teak lubricates my blades and ameliorates the silica. Wingate has a lot of silica in it. If you hold up a Wingate board, you can actually see it glitter a little bit. If you think about where Wingate grows, it's an African species, and there's certainly rainforest in Africa, but in the southern Africa region where it grows, it's very sandy, very, very sandy soil. So it is going to blunt your tools quite a bit because of the high silica nature of it. And oh, by the way, that high silica nature also interferes with the bond between those fibers, causing it to splinter a little bit more. So yeah, Wingate is a good example of a. Why would we use Wingate ever? I don't. 
<laughs> when, when you get a commission from a customer that loves wingy. And actually, that, you know, there's, there's, there's a good thing there. Wingy is one of those species that looks, I actually think looks better unfinished. You get that cool dark and the chocolate brown, and then you put oil on it, and it's all black. You know? And it's black, but doesn't have the high luster of ebony. You've got to pour fill the thing from here to Timbuktu to get it to polish up nicely. Um, and it will split on you real easily. So yeah, I mean, we sell a lot of wingay for flooring, which I just think is a terrible idea. I mean, but, he, but again, here's an example where the flooring industry looks primarily at Jenka hardness. They're blinders focused on Jenka hardness, and you can't just look at one element and go, oh, it's hard, therefore it's good. You know, because what I really care about in flooring is that it be really hard and not get dented when I walk on it. But, you know, we get complaint after complaint about Wingate floors. That and the fact that I think a really dark floor is kind of, just dominates a room, you know? <laughs> that room will always be dark because you've got that floor. Give me another wood species. Pick another wood species. Black locust. Ooh, black locust is a good one. Black locust is a really good one. Um, black locust is ring porous, and it's hard. We're going to look at this, and we're going to see Janka hardness of 1,700 pounds per square inch. Let's look at the porosity first. It is ring porous with large early wood pores two to three pores wide and small late wood pores and clusters and tangential bands. Tylos is extremely abundant. What did we say about tylos earlier? That's what makes white oak an exterior species. Well, in this case, tyloses are extremely abundant. And we know that black locust, maybe we don't know, but black locust makes great fence posts. You can dig a hole and stick it in direct contact with the dirt and it won't rot for many, 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 many years because of all that tylos in the pores. And because the pores are large and they're crammed full of that, there's even more tylose or caulk. Just think of it as silicone caulk. There's more caulk in that wood than there would be in white oak because the pores in, in black locust are actually bigger. So you've been able to cram a higher amount of caulk in that wood than you have in, in, um, in white oak. Um, where are we here? In grain. So we'll look at straight grain. Uh, grain texture is straight with the medium texture. So We've got a good idea there. We know our hardness is 1,700 pounds per square inch. So what do we wanna, what do we know? Let's compare it against another ring pore species like, well, let's do white oak, because that's also an exterior grade species. We're gonna find, whoops, too far. We'll find that the ingrain is not only, you can definitely see the ring porous nature I should be able to. So we can see the ring porous nature here, but one might actually say is this semi ring porous. I mean, there's no, there's no denying this. You know, there is a definite ring porous band, but the difference you'll find, and I could pull up a white oak, but just trust me on this. Um, the difference you'll find with white oak is you'll have that very distinct band of, of tight pores. But the area in between, the pores are not going to be as big. Um, what that tells me is, A, there's more pores for the tylos to be, to be stuck into. That's why black locust is more rot resistant and almost, almost rot proof as compared to white oak being rot resistant. But it's also going to contribute to the fact that it's just that much harder. And this is what's weird. We have more pores, right? So shouldn't it be easier to work? But it's not, because we have more pores crammed full of a weird chemical substance like caulk, which is hard and crystalline in nature. And locus is extremely blunting on your tools, because not only is there tylose in there, but it's also sucking up sand and silica, because it tends to grow in southern climes with sandy soil. So it is uh, very, very blunting on your tools. It will split nicely, but it's also hard as the dickens. Um, and that extra um, hardness that we see, 1,700 versus, uh, what, 1,400 in white oak, is indicative actually of that foreign body, if you will, the extra silica and everything that's in black locust. And also, hold up black locust to light, and you'll see it glitter as well. Does that have the bending strength? Uh, yes, and that's a good question because bending strength, sometimes it says bending strength, sometimes it says modulus of um, elasticity or modulus of rupture, sorry, see even I get that mixed up. Sometimes it just says MOR, 
Bending strength and MOR are the same. Stiffness and MOE or modulus elasticity are the same thing. And in the Wood database site, it uses modulus of rupture and modulus or elastic modulus, which is um, Young's modulus if you're a mechanical engineer. Um, so yeah, and you know what? Those numbers are really frustrating. Modulus of rupture is 19,400 pounds per square inch. That tells me absolutely nothing. Um, elastic modulus, 2 million. 50,000 pounds per square inch. Again, that tells me absolutely nothing. You need to compare it against something else. But you can look at that number and go, damn, that's high. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're getting very scientific and then applying a very non-scientific terminology over top of it. This is why I say you can go down this rabbit hole and become a total wood geek. And you know, you spend all your days examining the technical properties of wood and never actually working anything. Eventually, pick up a piece of black locust and you'll go, man, that's really heavy. And you knock on and go, damn, that's really hard. And we just, that was the session. But I needed to fill two hours, so <laughs> I couldn't do that. You said, again, you said that if you're familiar with the characteristics of one of these woods, you can use their characteristics. Yeah. And, you know, that you haven't dealt with. And that's what's key, because we're not identifying wood species, we're comparing wood species. So what we're doing here is, you know, we're throwing out, so what we really should be doing is comparing two different species. We're just looking at one at a time. But the idea is if we can take those control species, the ones, the control species, I like to think of as cherry and white oak and maple because those are the ones that I play with most of the time. But your control species may be totally different. Your control species may be poplar. You know, it may be white pine. You know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But the key is that you have a firsthand experience with that species. And in some instances, you may not be able to group apples to apples. You may not have intimate experience with a ring porous wood. You may only have experience with a diffuse porous wood. Um, so if you're, if you're thinking, well, how's black locust going to work? I don't have any ring porous experience. Well, let's lump poplar up against black locust. And you're going to see a 540 Jenka hardness and a 1930 Jenka hardness, which goes back to my original, my original statement of, damn, it's hard. You know, it's, it's the technical representation of, wow, that's really, really hard. And it's really, really heavy. Um, let's get another one, another species. Leopard. Leopardwood, nice. They're all this exotic Why not? Let's use the search bar for that one. Because the question is, what is leopardwood? You're going to find different species in different parts of the world that are also called leopardwood. Because the reason it's called leopardwood is because of that kind of um, lacy oak structure, she oak structure. There's another example. Lacy oak here, she oak in Australia. Totally different species, but they look kind of the same. So now, let's look at first things first. The ingrain is diffuse porous with small to medium pores. Let's go and look at the image here. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. Or I can like do pinch and zoom because it's cool. Um, the, those dark stripes, those are medullary rays. And if you look at, you know, white oak, we're all familiar with white oak, right? And we love that ray fleck pattern. That's ray fleck. That's what makes it leopard wood. So just looking at that face, and, and the crazy thing, when you've got pores or rays that are that big, you'll find that the ray fleck presents not just on the quarter that's on faces, it will definitely present on the rift face, and it will even present on the flats on face because they're just so big. So what do we know about leopard wood? It's hard. 2150 on the Jenker rating. Um, we know that it is, it is ring porous, and it has pretty big pores, but not nearly as big as something like red oak. So already, we're going to see, just comparing what we know about red oak or white oak, because again, big medullary rays, medullary rays are going to be really dense. They're going to be really hard to plane. So there's some similarities there. But looking at those pores there, this pore structure, it's, they're pretty small. I mean, they're ordered, but it's small. You also can see the little crystalline deposits in there. That's Tylos again. And what, what we know from our experience with black locusts and oak and white oak is that that tylose is going to harden things up a little bit more too. So already, that Jenka number, that what was it, 2190 that we saw, it, you can see the factors whoops, contributing to that. It's quite a bit harder. Uh, what else do we want to look at before we move away from this? And we'll go to sycamore. You're going to find that the appearance, I mean, other than the color being dramatically different, and it's key, American sycamore, not European sycamore. European sycamore is also known as Acer plantis, or plane tree maple. 
It's maple. <laughs> it's not sycamore. Um, the, uh, OK. Here, you can see you've got that Rayfleck pattern. Let's look at the images. Very cool, right? Cool Rayfleck pattern there. Definitely not as pronounced as the leopard wood or something like she oak. Um, the ingrain looks similar, right? You've got those medullary rays. Can you guys make those out? It's so densely packed. But you've got pretty pronounced medullary rays and very, I mean, it's like a Yankees uniform. It's so pinstriped there. And lots of tiny little pores. So there are a lot of similarities there, but look up here. What do we say, 19 something for the hardness on, on the leopard wood? 770 pounds per square inch. Yeah, it was 21 something for leopard wood. Um, that's a dramatic difference. You're talking about a wood now that is softer than cherry, softer than, than, than walnut, but yet in all outward appearances based on porosity and grain structure, it looks very much like something like leopard wood or you know, she oak or, or um, well, she oak. So why? Why is that such a huge difference? So now we've got to look at the specific gravity. OK, well, it's 0.46. The leopard wood is 0.73. And this is a really good example because, as I said before, the specific gravity, the density, is one of your more obscure numbers that you may not always be able to find. But at all outwards appearances, we looked first at the porosity, right? That was the first thing. Then we looked at the hardness and the grain. They're identical. So, well, the hardness is unidentical. The hardness is, that, is that, that red flag that something's weird's going on here. But all of those other elements that we looked at, those, those primary elements to this system I'm talking about, line up until we get to density. And density was the last one that I said, check that one last. So here we're going through this, and it's like, this doesn't make sense. Why is it so different? There's a 0.2 difference in density. It's a pretty dramatic density difference. So, even though the pore structure is the same, there's kind of some dead air. The, the, the pores are definitely, see, that's the other one. The pores, we saw the pores on leopard wood, right? They were decently sized. I'd call those small to medium sized. But again, lots of tylose in there. Then we look at the pores on sycamore. They're pretty tiny, but there's a lot of them. So we might, it might be a wash as far as the amount of dead air that's in there, but all that stuff in between, all the stuff that's packed into the medullary rays, all the cellulose that's in between those pores has a 0.2 difference in density, which is what makes up for that dramatic difference in hardness. So again, this is a little bit of a weird example because they're both kind of obscure. It's difficult to go and buy American sycamore, although I've got a beautiful one in my backyard that <laughs> My neighbors desperately want me to cut down, and I just know it's all the shade. But let's look at European sycamore. As I said, they're different, right? They're not the same, not the same uh, species. Janka hardness of 1050. But it's, it's, but it's categorized as nicer. Yes. Well, and you know, if you really want to get nerdy on this, <laughs> you can start to look at the botanical names, the Latin names of these. Acer is the genus for maple. Um, Acer rubra uh, is red maple. This is Acer pseudoplantanus, which is similar to uh, Pseudosuga plantanus, which is Douglas fir, by the way. I don't know why I just said that. It's just because it's fun to say pseudoplantanus. <laughs> this is where like the cocktail party, like wowing your friends really comes into play. You start to, you know, you either wow them or get shown to the door. And 60% of the time, it works every time to get you thrown out the door. So, so we're looking at the ingrain of European maple, plane tree maple, European sycamore, rather, plane tree maple. And man, <laughs> you can't even see pores there. Uh, it's really densely packed. So you can obviously see there's a dramatic difference between that and that. So we're still calling them the sycamore. Something's fishy here. So th there is a little bit of, of taxonomic botanical naming that goes into play here. But you know, we didn't even talk about that. That is something, you know, if you wanted to, to see, does this work really well? I really like this particular species. I really like working with walnut. You know, can I find some other species like that? Well, find something else in the Euglens genus. Euglens nigra is, is walnut. Um, butternut, somebody. You get a gold star. Good for you. 
There, that is the, the, the cousin of walnut, but it's a heck of a lot softer. So tread carefully there just because it's the same cousin. But intandophragma uh, cylindricum, sepili, intandrophragma utile, utile or sepo, they are direct cousins. They look almost exactly the same. But utile is 200 pounds per square inch softer than sepili. But they work very much the same. Utile is the easier cousin to work with sepili. So if you really like that ribbon strike look of quarter sawn sepili, but man, this stuff is dusty and it is actually quite toxic. It can really like stuff you up and, and it, it's just really dusty. It's not that much fun to work with. Utile is not nearly as dusty because it's got a little bit more open pore structure. Therefore, it's a little bit softer, more dead air for more compression, and it makes a really nice substitute. Fortunately, they're the same price, so it doesn't really, you can't really fall back on that. Give me another species here. Paduke. Paduke. Ooh. So Paduke, what would we want to compare that with? Let's compare that with African. That's primarily what you're going to see. Um, the other Padukes, though, are also Pterocarpus genus. Right. So you are going to find, they are actually, that one actually makes sense. You, they are similar in a lot of ways. Compared to Osage Orange, does it look kind of similar? Well, but how many people in here have experience working with Osage Orange? All right. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you ask woodworking in America, you know? Let's go down the hall to that 60th high school reunion and ask them, how many of you work with Osage Orange? I ate an orange this morning. And, and I have no problem comparing species to species, but remember, the whole idea of a control species. If you really want to know how African Paduke works, I can spout numbers all day long and I can tell you, I can stand here and tell you that it's going to be a very hard wood, it's going to be very interlocked, it's going to rip and tear out left and right, it's going to be brittle, it's not going to hold your details quite as well, even though it's really, really hard, it's going to splinter out on you, it's going to turn everything in your shop orange. Um, it is not a very friendly species. I can stand here and tell you this and hopefully you trust me. If you don't trust me, just don't say anything. But, but the idea is when you get back to your shops and you're in your house and you go, ooh, I saw some Paduke, what am I getting into? The idea is to fall on what you know. And we know, maybe we know cherry, maybe we know white oak. So like I said, I'll compare whatever to whatever all day long, but just remember when you get back to your own shop, you can compare Osage Orange to African Paduke and if you never work with either of them, you kind of are like, eh, what does this really tell me? So that's the system that we're here to talk about. Good, good, all right. But I've already said it's gonna be really hard. We know that by looking at this number, 1970 pounds per square inch. We look at the grain, yeah, it's straight, but it sometimes can be interlocked, which is absolute BS, it's always interlocked. I've never seen straight grain Paduke ever. Maybe if you look at the face of a Rifson piece, there it's straight grain, but it's actually interlocked underneath it. The um, coarse open texture, but with a good natural luster. Remember we talked about grain and those weird things at the bottom like luster and irregularity and texture? Well, what's that about? We have a, a nice natural luster, but where'd it go? There it is. But it's got a coarse open texture. That doesn't seem to work, right? Why, why would that be? It seems to me the open texture would kind of defeat, defeat that luster, right? You can't get a high gloss surface unless you fill those pores. If you've got an open texture, that shouldn't work. There's a red flag right there. The stuff that's in between those little potholes is hard, 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 dense stuff. Um, and not only are you going to have that washboard effect of Douglas fir between those open potholes, but the stuff in the potholes is going to be hard too. And the stuff on top is going to be really, really hard, which is what gives you that splintery, not splintery, but fracturous, brittle nature of Paduke. When, you're, when you plane, you don't get a little bit of tear out, you get like crater tear out on the stuff because it fractures, it shards away, again, almost like flint or, or quartz or something like that. Um, it's almost as hard too. This is one of those instances where Janka hardness only tells us half the story and when we start looking at the grain, we start looking at the ingrain, we start to maybe jump that hardness number up even more. Yeah, that ingrain is, uh, look at that. There's barely any pores in the thing. How does it breathe? I don't know. Here's another, uh, here's another terracarpus weed, which is uh, gnarlywood. <laughs> no, no, no. Have you, I mean, have you worked with it? Yes, I have. I've only turned it. I, I mean, 
and I've only turned highly figured Nara too, which, yeah. which, which is another point. Maple, we know how maple works. Now add tiger maple to the equation. Yeah, it just got harder. We just upped the ante. You know, you're now on a, a $50 anti-poker game instead of a five cent anti-poker game. It's a very, because now you're dealing with mostly ingrain. You've changed the har whole hardness and, and texture structure of the wood because you've added figure. So now we're talking about, yes, it's a straight grain wood, but it also has wavy or irregular grain structure as well. Because again, we look at porosity first, then we look at grain, then we look at hardness, then we look at density. In that order, and that will really help you dial in exactly what we're looking at. So um, yeah, why not? Let's look at NARA just because it's, it's obscure. Um, it's, a good, it's a good comparison because we are talking again about another pterocarpus that's the same genus as the Paduk. Um, but this one, I know I keep adding in elements here, but this is, now we're into fun time. Um, look at the distribution of this. We know that Paduk is from Africa, and it's mostly sub-Saharan Africa, so highly silica-rich soils. This is from Southeast Asia. This is rainforest land, which, oh, by the way, is also heavily silica-rich. This is where teak comes from. So we're talking probably of a similar silica content, but we're also talking about it's hot and wet all the time as compared to hot and dry that we're gonna get in Sub-Saharan Africa. So you're gonna get differences in growth patterns, which we may find in the grain. Grain is usually interlocked, can be sometimes wavy with uneven and more the medium to coarse texture, good. It's semi-ring porous, which would make a lot more sense because you're not really having a lot of early and late growth going on there, so it's kind of blending in together. Kind of similar to the Paduk, isn't it? Pores are there, there's more pores here, which would tell me that ultimately this would probably be a little bit easier to work because there's a little bit more um, compression factor. Um, what did we say the hardness is? 1260. What was Paduk? Like 1920, wasn't it? So there we go. There's our indicator right there. Our pore structure, there's more pores, there are larger pores, but a lot of the other stuff, let's look at density, 0 0.54, 0 0.61 is your specific gravity, and we said 0.54. So again, those two numbers, the size of our pores, the fewer number of pores in the Paduk and the higher density is our red flag that tells me that I would probably rather work with NARA more than anything else. I want to do one more because this is one you may run into. We're going to use walnut as our control species, American black walnut, Euglens nigra. And we're going to compare that to Nogal, Peruvian walnut, which I would think would be under Nogal. Hey, look at that. Peruvian walnut. <clears throat> Juglans neotropica is the species you're primarily looking at. But again, remember I said the genus there is an indicator. You've got some, some cousins. You've got a South American cousin of American black walnut, and you're going to find that we know that black walnut is what, 10, 10? 10, 10, 10, Janka hardness for black walnut. We know that it's semi-ring porous. We used that as an example early on. We know that walnut works really well. It planes really well. It chops really well. It holds details nicely. What does Peruvian walnut tell us? Um, so let's look at porosity first. It's diffuse porous. American black walnut is semi-ring porous. So you're gonna have a denser wood altogether. Um, now let's look at the grain. It's straight grain, can be a regular, medium to coarse texture. That's the same as black walnut, so we're, we're kind of even there. So now we'll look at the Janka hardness. Proving walnut is, is 960. Well, what's up with that? You would think, if well, all this other stuff seems the same, why would it actually end up being softer? That doesn't really make sense. So let's look at black walnut, and we'll look at the specific gravity, 0.51 dry. Nogal, 0.5 dry. What the heck is going on here? Why is it actually softer? And I specifically bring this up because who cares? <laughs> it's 960 pounds per square inch versus 1,010 pounds per square inch. Not that big of a difference, right? So this is the, the, the parting shot of saying, yes, we're going to look at these numbers to tell us some general differences, but we're talking in generalities here. Peruvian walnut and American black walnut both actually work really well. Uh, I've built a toolbox out of Peruvian walnut, so now you can look at it and, and you can say, okay, I know that this is gonna work very much like black walnut. 
it actually might be a little bit easier to work. You could dig a little bit deeper and find some other eccentricities of Peruvian walnut. It's much more prone to cell collapse, which is one of the reasons you're probably going to find that it's a little bit softer. There actually is a little bit more dead air in Peruvian walnut than black walnut um, because of the way the pores are grouped together. It also means that you got to be careful when you dry it. So if you buy Peruvian walnut, make sure that it's, you've, had, you've asked some questions and examined the boards because you might get these little divots in it because you've had cell collapse. It's not quite case hardening, but it's kind of the same thing. But that is what indicates that would be the contributing factor to making it a little bit softer. But what, it, what are we talking about here? 50 pounds per square inch. It's not really that big of a difference when we're talking about numbers normally in the thousands of pounds per square inch. Um, so this is a good example of the system, if you will, in practice. I love working with American black walnut, but I want to branch out a little bit. I really do want that kind of dark chocolate color. And by the way, Nogal, beautiful. It's even darker than American black walnut. It's got more purple streaks in it. And it's not commonly st steamed. Like we steam all the black walnut and take all the color and character and fun out of it. Um, Peruvian walnut, they just, they just don't do that. It's not a practice that happens in, in South America. So if you can't find steamed American black walnut and you want that creams and purples and greens and chocolate browns and dark chocolate browns, Peruvian walnut is a good place to go. So that's all I have, folks. <laughs>